All right, so uh, we uh, we just wanted to kind of get all of the, all these guys and young ladies together uh, to talk to them about you know, their power, their training with a power meter, how that went for the season, uh, and also their goals for the race this Saturday, and uh, just talk a little bit about uh, you know how they use it for training and racing. And of course, if you guys have any questions, you can certainly field those. Um, you know, just by means of uh, introduction. Uh, I, wrote the book on training race with the power meter, uh, co-founder of Training Peak Software, and uh, worked with all these, these guys in training with the power meter. So, um, this is Rasmus Henning. Rasmus, how long have you been using a power meter? Uh, I've been using a power meter for, for a decade now, and then worked for the last two years. So, uh, quite familiar with it. I've been using it for a long time, and, but uh, I'm sure I can still learn a lot of things from this guy, just at the book, so I'm going to go home and study and get even more uh, <laughs> confident in this issue. Alright, Kate, the lockers, how long have you been using it? I've just been using it for a year now, and uh, that was my coach being consistent and consistent that I use it, because he loves it and uses it all the time, and, and wants all the data. He says, you know, get the data for him, it gives him so many um, options for training and where I should be for racing, so um, yeah, it's, it's great, it, it gives you a lot of focus during training. And Luke McKenzie, tell us uh, how long you've been using a power meter. And... I used a power meter when I was younger, when I was coming up to Race Training Institute of Sport program for quite a few years. And then uh, I sort of went on my own way for a while and strayed away from the, from the power and drove by field for quite a few years. But uh, in the last 18 months, I've been riding a bike and uh, found that it's definitely uh, helping me ride more controlled and getting better results out of my training. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be back in the So Rasmus, uh, we were talking earlier, um, you know, today, kind of, you know, everybody's a little sensitive about how much power they're going to use and, and telling other you know, athletes and stuff, but ultimately, you know, how much ever, how many ever watts you're going to put out, you're going to put out. And, uh, and, and you also kind of have to, the same thing with Kate, we were talking earlier, it's not just that number, you have to take into account your perceived exertion, your cadence, uh, the heat, the heart rate. Um, and so, earlier tonight, today we were talking about how many watts you were thinking about, you know, okay, this is what I can average. I mean, what, uh, how, do, how did you kind of come up with that number? Uh, and tell us what you think you can do, and, and then also if that's, how you're going to change, you know, what wattage you might hold through the race if, you know, different conditions appear. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at averaging about 280 watts for, for in an Ironman race. That's that's what I've been doing in a number of races. And um, I don't look at it so much during the race. It's not like, uh, oh, sorry guys, uh, I'll let you go because I'm a little bit over. I know that the first hour of, of this race is always going to be a lot higher. Then it's generally going to be a lot lower for a while. Then it might become a little bit higher again. And towards the end, it usually drops just because of uh, because you're getting tired. But um, but but it's it's more like I, I know that if I'm if I'm at a 295 average uh, with say 50k to go, I know that if somebody goes off the front, it might not be wise for me to try to follow because then I will go over my limit and I know it's going to cost too much on the run. There might still be some tactical aspect to it and you might want to do it despite of all that, but that's sort of my guidelines and what I'm, what I'm looking to, to be doing. Now, do you see, um, you know, I know there's been a lot of talk, especially you guys too, I mean, it's a way in here about the, the winds, you know. What is, uh, I mean, how do you factor into the wind with your power, or do you? Yeah, I mean, I think the, that's one of the big tricks with the power meter that you should look more at uh, keeping a consistent power than actually thinking much about the wind. I live in the Canary Islands uh, where it's very, very windy, and I I, uh, I find it tremendously important to have that power meter just in those uh, conditions because sometimes I'll be riding out and I might be averaging 12, 15 miles an hour for, for, for an hour going out in the headwind. But as long as I can see that the power that I'm putting out there is actually okay, then then it my mind can rest assured that I'm doing what I need to do and, and I shouldn't just go home and go to bed because I'm tired and then when I turn around eventually I'll right. just fly back with 40 miles an hour and uh, and I can still try to keep the same power it's not that I say oh I should slow down I'm going too hard here because uh, and, and, and that's also actually a really good uh, uh, 
thing to practice in relation to this race, being able to put out high power uh, even when you're going really fast. Yeah, awesome. Can you tell us about kind of how you've seen training with the power meter and, and the, then the wind conditions and a little bit of your strategy for Saturday too? Yeah. Um, I'm definitely the same, like I, I live by in training and like to use, you know, if I have a session that's based on Ironman pace, then I know what wattage I need to be training at, and if I need to be picking it up to half Ironman pace, I know what wattage I need to be training at. Um, and, but the same applies, I think, on Saturday, that I have an idea in my head about what I'm capable of doing in terms of, in terms of that power, but I think in particular for us as professionals, we are guided a little bit by what's going on um, around us. And so, uh, you know, if, it, if it's the difference between um, staying with some people or being left on my own, I will, exactly what we said before, I will try and um, go with them, but I will, I'll know by the numbers if I'm going to be pushing too hard. Um, but in terms of in the wind, it's, I mean, it's great to know, rather than looking at your speed and thinking I'm going so slow, I need to be pushing harder. Exactly, you see your watts and you're still pushing at the watts you're meant to be then. You'll know you're working hard enough and you don't need to be. Um, you know, pushing in a hard, and that's a, a big deal on Saturday, especially you know, heading out to harbour, you're going up there, you just have to be consistent the whole way. It's very easy to just turn that corner and start heading up and put the speed on and try and get up there, but it's a long climb, and, um, and you'll suffer, you know, with 50 k's to go coming back, so it's a good way of controlling those things. So really pacing, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, that's, that's to me is something that I talk about all the time, is how do you use it as a pacing tool, yeah. and, and then, you know, and kind of like what you talked about, restricting even as a governor, you know, this is a really key part of that, too, so. Yeah, definitely. And it's good because, um, you know, you have your pace now, but next year, I want to be 10 watts higher, so I start training at that pace as 10 watts higher, and I can only do it this time, but then a month later, I can do it this time, and so it's, it's great for that sort of reason. Luke, tell us a little bit about your strategy uh, uh, for Saturday, how you're going to use your power meter, uh, and then, too, you know, do you have any thoughts about the wind and, and how that might affect you know, yourself and, and your strategy? I mean, I think what Rasmus was talking about earlier, obviously this race uh, is quite renowned for a really fast pace at the start, and to tell you the truth, the first hour to hour and a half of this event, really, um, there's not many outside factors that really... Um, affect the race just yet, you know, the wind's not quite up yet and everyone's going out of the gate uh, quite hard, so obviously you're going to be averaging a little higher power earlier on. Um, I'm obviously going to try and keep my wattage uh, as even as I can, you know, I think the wind is obviously a big factor at this race, but also the hills, you know, we've got uh, the climb up to Harvey and uh, if, if we're uh, exerting too many watts at certain points of that climb, that can really sting the legs for later on. And, Obviously, we want to be getting off the bike with fresh legs, and so we're going to know where that limit is, um, you know, and try, try and evenly pace the bike as much as possible to get off with fresh, fresh enough legs to, to have a good marathon. Right, right. So I think that's that's a really key point that he uh, talks about too, is, is that, you know, it's, it's not only just pacing, but, you know, making sure that you've got the energy for the run, because it's not just a, a bike race. And, and, you know, to me, that's like one of the biggest parts of of training with a power meter, racing with it, is being able to say, okay, you know, I know that, you know, for an hour I can hold, say, 350 watts, but, you know, I've got to do this for, you know, 112 miles, and I've got to run a marathon afterwards, so, then, you know, uh, we really talk about, you know, percentage off of your threshold power, which is the power that you can hold for an hour, and then uh, using that as a guideline, so, um, you know, anywhere for, for the pros in here, they probably can average somewhere around the 73 to 80 percent of their threshold power for the, for the for the whole 112 miles, depending on heat, you know, other conditions and stuff. Uh, for more age groupers, they're lower in like the 68 to 72 percent of their threshold power. Um, so that's that's a great kind of guideline to start. Uh, but at the same time, you always have to again, like kind of Kate, you're talking about just like how you feel yeah. and. You know, yep. what's going on, so you got to always listen to it. So it's just a good tool. Um, you guys have any questions for us? Yeah, how do you guys sort out, um, you know, like for coming back from Javi, where there's a lot of, potentially a lot of tailwind and a lot of basically recovery, so you're going gonna to basically spin out, um, managing your power uh, and your numbers in terms of what you're expecting to, I guess, is kind of cold and what you're going to read on your 
Yeah, well, I, I think on, on the on the downhill uh, with a potential tailwind, it's it's uh, it's a matter of just uh, spinning those legs around as quickly as you can. Plus, have a high gearing. Uh, it's also something that I've been practicing a lot where I live. Because yeah. I do a lot of this, you know, 40 to 50 miles an hour, yeah. uh, still in the arrow, still trying to keep my pace, and uh, and I'm, I'm usually quite able to do that. So, uh, so I think that's it's going to be a key point for me in this race. Um, but uh, but obviously you you'll you'll come to a point where it doesn't make sense to pedal anymore, yeah. and then then you might just then you just try to so you, you just spend that that time. Uh, as, as good as you can by shaking your legs, stretching your back, or whatever you you need to do yeah. uh, to make it like an active recovery. Yeah. Uh, I think it's natural. You've just climbed Harvey too. You're going to obviously have a higher output climbing up. And yeah. If with the headwind, you're probably going to want to utilize that time to get a little bit of recovery because you know that once you get back to Spencer Hill and back to those rollers through Kauai uh, High and uh, Waikoloa, you're obviously going to be back on the power. And um, especially up senior lookout, all the way back, you're going to be on the power. So I think it's it's obviously it's harder to maintain a higher power output downhill. So it's yeah. it's probably one of the only places that you really get to sort of recover on the course for a consistent long period of time. You've all talked about trying to find a balance between reacting to the race and and the course and, and riding by your power. How do you know when to go beyond or, or underneath, if you were just talking about um, what that power number is is on average for you during the race? How do you know when to respond to another athlete for the course? Yeah, I mean, that, that's all the tactics of racing. Uh, that That's knowing your competition, knowing yourself. Uh, uh, one guy goes off the front, I'll say, well, we'll let him go. Another guy goes off the front, I'll say, well, now is the time I need to respond, even if I get out of my comfort zone or, um, and um, I mean it, it would take too long to, to tell you exactly who, who that would be and how I would respond and I probably wouldn't tell you anyway <laughs> um, but just to get the idea that's I've been doing that for years and years in ICU racing uh, you, you got to look at exactly who's doing what and uh, and sometimes you're just better off uh, relaxing maybe even wait for somebody else to close that gap and, and sometimes you need to go out and do it yourself. Do you think having that power data in front of you has changed the way the pack races? Like are, are, are people less aggressive now than they were 15 years ago, now that everybody has that number in front of them? No, I don't think yeah, so. I, I think mean, think you looked changed. at who won the race last year, Chris McCormack won the race without using the power. He went off field. So, I mean, how do we react to, you know, we're using the power yet? He makes that move with 20 kilometers to go. So, how are we to know whether he is overexerting himself yeah. and he's going to get on the marathon? Is he going to be able to run? I mean, he, he was able to do it last year, obviously, but um, they kind of gone the other way as well. So, that's the position that you're in. You know, do you let that guy go? And I mean, he's not using power, and you'll be all over for him and take kilometers up the road. So, that's it's the World Championships. Everyone's out here to try and to, to win this race. And People are going to race it differently, and I think that's where it's important to to know your limits and make the, that split second decision. What's what's too much and what's just right? That red line. I think it's given us a, a better understanding ourselves personally of us as an athlete and what we know we're capable of doing, like you know, leading up to the race, and like Luke said, knowing knowing the limits, having some idea about how far we've reached before we're not going to. I, I still think that, that the, the majority of the athletes will race more on, on feel and the, the dynamics of the field rather than based on their power meter. But I think it's, it's, um, it's more a, a tool that you can analyze from afterwards and it's something that you use very much in training leading up to the race. And also just in some parts of the course, like when, when you do those little climbs for instance, just looking at it, oh, shoot I'm doing 380 watts now, maybe. Do I, do I actually need to do that just because the guy in front is doing it? Well, maybe I, I'd rather drop it to 320 and let a couple of guys pass me on this hill and then I'll catch back up on the downhill where they will be doing less and I can sort of maintain sort of a more stable curve of, of power rather than going up and down all the time. That's, I mean, that's, I think that's from a personal perspective. I think from an age group perspective, 
the race is very different, especially if you're you know just done a couple of Ironmans and you still don't quite have that feel and understand you know which a lot of pros may tend to race with. I think it's a great guide for the race to know that this is this is where I work out, this is the wattage I work out, this is where I know I can run well off. And, and I, I know a lot of I have a lot of age group friends that they will, this is the watch they will say to me, this is what I'm riding at, you know, and, and they will do it and they'll have a great day because they they worked at that pace. So. That, I mean, that's a good point, and that's I me. Mean, I think that's where you always have to kind of think about, you know, taking into account like the pros have a different strategy Absolutely. than the, the age groupers do, and so um, you know, for age group athletes looking at their power meter, it really gives them that quantitative, you know, objective. Here it is. Here's my number. If I stick to this, I know I'll be able to run. Um, and, and they don't have to worry about some some guy going off the front or some woman going off the front. They have to chase them down and stay with them. So I think that's a different perspective. But um, like, I like the fact that, that you're looking at you know looking at your power going up a hill and saying okay you know just even this little hill just a subsection of uh, the whole thing you're looking at it to see if this is the right thing to do. So. Michael. Yeah. Um, more of a roadie than than a triathlon, but I, I've always had this question, and I, I want to understand where you guys set your thresholds. You know, you were talking about your, your, your mid-200s or whatever what number. Is that based on prior races, or is that based on training? And you guys are training at that wattage consistently enough to know. So I'm always, yeah, I'm curious, and, and do you expect things to be 10% higher in the event itself because of adrenaline and, you know, competition and all that, or, or you're sticking with that? And So where does that threshold come from? Is that prior races, or is it training, or is it both? Or is it coach? <laughs> well, the, 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 the average wattage for the Ironman is something that is based on previous races. That I know that that's where I've been at and that's where I'm pretty comfortable. Uh, like Kate was saying before, it would be lovely for next year if you could increase that by 5 watts or 10 watts, just as a natural development. Uh, but then I take that onto my training and I know that if we want to do Ironman pace, it's, it's about 280 watts. If we want to do a little bit above, it's 290 to 300. And, and then you, you, you train around that. Okay. I actually do like a 30 minute power test. Um, every now and then I get one slotted into my program and then that gives out um, you know, a value that will set, um, then we'll work at 80% or 75% of that for uh, our recovery and then you know, 85% for Ironman and then, we, and then above that for you know, anaerobic threshold work. And we use that value and then we retest it. Um, so that's another way as well. How do you correct for conditions out here? The weather's different. Right, right. So you always have to think about, um, you know, the humidity is a huge issue here in heat. So um, if, if you can do, you got to look at about a 10% factor there uh, if you're not accustomed to it or acclimatized to it. Um, so let's say, for example, if you're if you're going to, you know, hold 250 watts, you can hold that in you know, a low humidity, relatively cool environment. Then here, you know, it's going to be 225 or something. So it's going to be a big difference if you're not acclimatized to it. If you've been here for a couple of weeks, then you're fine. Um, you're going to probably have acclimatized to it. You'll probably be able to get closer to that 250 watts number. Uh, I think that's that's the one thing. So it's always going to be, especially at this play, at this level, uh, you're always going to try and be a little more conservative in your wattage. Um, but I mean, I think that's probably the biggest factor. You know, Luke, you've been here for a while. I mean, when you first came here from uh, Oregon, uh, you know, you were in you know, a really relatively low environment, humidity environment, but relatively warm. I mean, how long did it take for you to kind of feel like, okay, I, I feel good in this heat humidity? Um, I, I guess I, I don't really notice it that, that much here in, in Hawaii, because I'm, I'm from a humid environment in Australia, and even though I did come from Oregon and Hawaii, yeah, yeah, Vegas, yeah. it was quite a dry environment, uh, I think it's it's a natural thing um, for my body to adapt quite quickly to the, to, the, to the humidity here. So I actually really like it. I mean, the hot, humid races are what I really like to race. So um, that's exactly the reason I came out here early. You know, um, training up in Oregon was great, but I didn't want it to be too much of a shock to the system. You know, it's starting to cool down there. So I thought, you know, it's time to move on, get out here, get, get acclimatized, get comfortable with it. Get back in the wind, you know, we don't have so much wind up in Oregon, so um, yeah, and there's a few factors in why I chose to come out here. Right?
Do you feel like your watts are about the same from Oregon, or obviously you've gotten fitter since then, so they probably come up some? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, over the last few weeks I've concentrated on short, shorter, sharper efforts since I've been out here. You know, I felt like I was lacking that up in Oregon. I got a lot of good, strong, longer rides in, but since I've been out here, I've really been focusing on the 10, 15, 20 minute efforts and, and working at a just slightly higher than race. Um, I'm in race uh, what? And um, yeah, no, I feel like my, my cycling has, has come up a lot in the last four weeks, especially. Excellent. Any other questions? Uh, I have one question, Mr. K. You said that you liked it in, uh, in your um, your training. I just wondered if you're going to pick the one single thing that this was actually giving you a benefit for. What would you say is it more for training or more for your race? What do you think you can't split those two things? I th I think because of the way because we're professionals, the way that the strategy and the tactics come into play at our level, um, training. I mean, is invaluable. Tool. Absolutely. Um, you know, going out and doing. You know, three, four, thirty-minute efforts at Ironman pace. Bang! I know what I need to be doing. Yeah, it's it's perfect for that sort of thing. So for me, at this point in time, it, it, um, it, you know, it's a perfect tool there. And then it's just it, then it's used as a guide when it comes to racing. Can I ask you, obviously all of you have been on bikes for a long, long time, um, so have you ever, ever perceived any possible change between having it on the bike and not having it on the bike, as far as feel is concerned? You mean just having, yeah, having like, the actual exactly, actually equipment having, on there? Yeah. Oh, you mean like weight wise and yeah, stuff? Yeah, like no, there's, no, a, there's no, absolutely this no. Mean, well, feel <laughs> as in um, you know everything, you know, noise, feel, anything at all. Is there any particular no, change? I mean, yes. to me, having a bike on your bike is just like having any other set of cranks. You've got no idea, is there? I've had people come up to me and go, "Are you using power?" And they go, "Where is it?" The only downside the that there used to be was uh, I initially had the SRM with cables. Yeah. Then every time you, you had to move it to another bike, moving the actual crank set and that was not a big deal, but all the cabling with zip ties and everything all over the bike was a nightmare. But now with it, with, with it's all wireless, it's, it's easy. Yeah. Actually, yeah. to tell you the truth, I, I had the SRM back in the day, back around the early 2000s, and I, I remember that my bike had a slight lean to one side because the crank was actually quite heavy back when they were first sort of evolving. And I, I'm, I haven't used the SRM since then, but um, yeah, nothing like that. Oh,